Hello and welcome to today's coding challenge, the Ulam Spiral, also known as the Prime Spiral. No, I actually like to say it the other way around. Oh, I did a whole rehearsal and everything, but fine, I'm just gonna keep that in. Now, why am I doing this coding challenge, you might ask? I have a new system. Last week on the Coding Train's Twitch stream, I spun a wheel of ideas and it landed on the Ulam Spiral. What is the Ulam Spiral? So it's named for the Polish mathematician Stanislav Ulam, and I think that the story goes that he was sitting in a lecture, bored, and doodling numbers, drawing them in this sort of spiral pattern and then marking ones that were prime. And lo and behold, this pattern emerged. Now this like might not look too exciting to you, but it's truly a mathematical wonder. The set P appears to exhibit a strongly non-random appearance, a different appearance from randomly chosen sets whose densities are like those of primes. And to make this happen, there are really two things that I need to figure out how to do. So hopefully you're gonna learn two new coding techniques. One is, how do I arrange numbers along a spiral pattern? And two, how do I write an algorithm to determine whether a number is prime or not prime? Composite would be the other word if it's not prime. Let's start by looking at the spiral pattern itself. So I'm gonna write the number one, then I'm going to move one space to the right and draw the number two, write the number two. Then I'm going to move up and write the number three. Then I'm going to move over to the left and do four, and then five, six. All right, so I'm starting with just all of the numbers between one and 25. We can see it ends up in a five by five grid. Let me erase those arrows there because they're a little distracting. The next step, of course, would be for me to start marking the numbers that are prime or the numbers that are composite. I could use different colors or different shapes. So many visual possibilities. But before I get there, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's just see if I can figure out how to write the code to draw this spiral itself. And I know that I erased those arrows and now I'm realizing I really want them in there because I need to understand how it is that I'm turning and which direction I'm going. Now I can clearly see this as a spiral. Let's begin. So first things first, I need to figure out where is my starting point. I'm gonna start in the middle of the canvas. Then I need to keep track of what number am I on, and I'm gonna start with the number one. Let's actually draw the number one in the center of the canvas. There we go. Now, I need to take one step to the right and increase the number. What does one step to the right mean? Well, if I wanna recreate what I have on the whiteboard and have it be five by five, currently my canvas is 500 by 500, so each step is 100 pixels. Now, of course, the numbers just go way off the screen. Uh, and at some point, I might want to save all of the information about the spiral into an array or something. But just to begin, I'm just gonna draw a background and set up, and we can see one, two, three. But I need to, once I've gotten to two, turn left and move up. Let's go take a look at that diagram again. So I need to make a rotation how often? We're taking one step and then one step, and then two steps, and then two steps. Then three, okay, then three, one, two, three, four, then four, one, two, three, four, and then four, aha! And then it would be five because I stopped, right? The, the prime spiral never ends in theory. I'm like, why is it four, four, and then this is wrong? Well, this is only four, but if I were to keep going, I would have a fifth, and I would have five, and then this would be five, and then I would have six, and then six, seven, seven, eight, eight, right? So we are every two turns increasing the number of steps we go by one. Let's see if I can implement that. Hopefully it made some sense to you. I think by writing the code, it will further elaborate and illustrate what I'm trying to do. Okay, so this is actually, the step is actually the step size. Let's call it that because if num modulus two equals zero, right? I need another variable. Number of steps, which starts at one. If num modulus two, and I can actually call this, you know what I think would make sense? Instead of calling this num, let's call this step. Like what step am I on? So I have the step size, the number of steps I need to take before I turn, 
Um, I could maybe use some help naming these variables. <laughs> I might refactor this. X is moving by the step size. The step goes up by one. If the step modulus two equals zero, then there's probably a very fancy way I could do this, but let me just have a variable called state. And I'm gonna use a switch statement. As you know, if you've ever watched the coding drain before, I cannot possibly retain in my brain the syntax for a switch statement, but let's see if I could do this for once. This might be a historic moment, the first time I correctly type out a switch statement without an error. Switch, I've already forgotten. Case, no, switch, state, case, zero, uh, colon. <laughs> it's not, I can't be right. Oh, case zero colon, yes. Uh, x plus equals step size, break, case one. But let, let me think about this, right? Again, whiteboard, case zero, x goes up, case one, y goes, because we're flipped, y goes down, x goes, well, x plus plus, y minus minus, x minus minus, y plus plus. Case one, y minus equals step size, case two, <laughs> X, this is so, I can't look at this anymore. I have to figure out the syntax. The chat is telling me parentheses around state. Oh, I think I got it right. I just was missing the parentheses. I think this is right. Move to the right, up, to the left, down. If step modulus two equals zero, the state should change. State equals state plus one. Ah, I need to get rid of this. All right, so that was wrong. Let me make the frame rate one just so we can watch it more slowly. One, two, three. No, no, turn, not up there, turn there. Wah! So first of all, I need to, as the state gets to four, cycle it back down to zero. So I can use the modulo operator. No, not modulus two, not modulus two, it's modulus, the whole point of this was not every two. I don't know why I wrote two in there with the whole, I just worked out this whole thing where it's modulo one, then modulo, then move go two before you turn, then go three before you turn. But I need to do two of the same step size before I turn. Not before I turn, before I change the step size. Oh, not step size. Number of steps. This is why my variables aren't named very well. Every number should be a turn now. There we go. Okay, that's, this is getting somewhere. Every number is a turn. I don't know if I really need another variable, <laughs> but if I add another variable, I'm pretty sure I can execute this, and then maybe we can go back and see if it's unnecessary. So I'm gonna do like turn counter equals zero. So this is a turn. So every time I turn, I increase the turn counter. And if the turn counter modulo two is zero, then the number of steps I need to take increases. Oh, ah, oh, oh, this is, so, <laughs> this is so frustrating. What a simple idea, and yet I seem to have gotten it wrong. Hold on, let's just get this right. The first time through, the state is zero, and it moves over by one. Then step now becomes two. You know what? This is a little bit silly, but this should definitely be down here. And you know what? That was actually just the problem. <laughs> Why was that the only problem? But that was the problem. <laughs> but I was trying to figure it out. I needed to like think it through, but I just moved it and it worked. But I, I realized that as I was going because the values are all correct for what I want to do, but I increased the step at the wrong time. That means that the order of operations here is important. Check if I need to change my state. Do I need to turn? If I do, turn. Every two turns, change the number of steps before which I turn. And we can put this at, we can comment this out, the frame rate, and we can see it fill up super fast. Now let's make this a bit higher resolution just to be able to see more numbers at first. I think it'll be 25 by 25 if the step size is 20. And then of course I need to have the text size be mapped to the size of what I'm doing here. 
let's actually just see what happens if I just set the text size to step size. Yeah, that works pretty well. But I think actually I don't feel now that I need to count. And I think that it would be nicer for me to just actually draw a rectangle in each of these spots. And I, that actually can be a square. Beautiful. So I think there's a lot of fun to be had just with that spiral pattern. And probably I could have done something where I draw it all at once instead of drawing it animate the spiral. But what I like about what I'm doing is I can choose to visualize this in a variety of different forms. For example, what if I want to draw a dot at each one of these spots and connect those dots with a line? So this is it with dots, but let me add previous x and previous y. Ooh, so this is a nice little happy accident where I never actually moved the previous X, so all the lines are being drawn from the center. <laughs> kind of a nice little pattern there. So save the previous one. There we go. So now I'm drawing it connected. Ooh, I'm liking this very much already. This is still going even after it's filled the space entirely, <laughs> so it would make sense for me to put some type of exit condition in here. So what is the total steps? It's the number of columns and rows in this grid. The number of columns is the width of the canvas divided by the step size. So I could calculate that really quickly here. And again, it's a square, so what I'm doing is a little bit unnecessary, but just in case we were to do it a different way, maybe. So now, in theory, once the step has reached the total number of steps, it's traversed every single spot, I can just stop the animation from happening by calling no loop. Let's wait and see. Oh no! Look at that empty spot! That should do the trick! Woohoo! Are you ready? Are you ready for the Ulam spiral? Now remember, the idea of the Ulam spiral, the prime spiral, is for me to note, to render, to draw a different a color, a point, a dot, at every one of these numbers that happens to be a prime number. What is a prime number? A prime number is any natural number for which there are two, no two other natural numbers besides itself and one, which when multiplied together equal that number. It has no factors other than itself and one. One is prime. Two is prime. Aha, two, by the way, as we're gonna see, is the only even number that is prime, right? Because any other even number is divisible by two. So two being the only even number that's prime, which really makes it kind of odd. <laughs> Somebody on Twitter sent me that joke, so I really can't take credit for it. <laughs> uh, three, prime. Four, not prime. Five, prime. And here we are seeing what is the magic, the sort of surprising beauty of the Ulam spiral. Why are the prime numbers arranged so often in these diagonals? Now we're using very, very few here, so we're barely scratching the surface of this, but let's go and actually implement this now in our code so we can see many more numbers of the prime spiral. Oh dear. I have made a terrible, terrible mistake. The definition of a prime number, my definition was pretty correct, but I missed a very important point, which is to say a prime number is a natural number greater than one. So let me come over here and erase this and fix it. The one is not a prime number. And yes, I think two will never be in a diagonal with any other prime because it is an even number and this diagonal will be only have even numbers in it. And so the next thing I need to do is write a function that receives a number and returns true or false depending on whether it's prime. Now, certainly I could use some kind of pre-built lookup table of primes, but let's write the algorithm. I'm sure this is something I've done before, although I have no immediate memory of doing so. So what do I need to do? I need to figure out if any other number 
other than itself or one is a factor of value. So I can look at every number starting at two all the way up to value. And if value modulo i is zero, I think I better take a bit of a minute more to explain this. To understand this, let's take a scenario. Let's say I'm trying to determine if the number seven, which we know is prime, is prime. So in the function, the variable value would have the number, would be the number seven. So I wanna take the number seven and test whether it's divisible by any number from two all the way up to itself. How do I know if a number is divisible by another one? Well, if I take that number, divide it by that number, and get a remainder of zero, then it is divisible. It is a factor of that number. And how do I get the remainder of division? That's what the modulo operator does. Seven modulo two is one. Seven modulo three is one. Seven modulo four is three. Seven modulo five is two. Seven modulo six is one. So seven is prime because none of these are zero. Now if I was using eight, as soon as I did eight modulo two, I'd get zero. And so I know eight is not prime because one of them, one of those values of the modulo operation returns zero. However, I don't need to do anything past half of the number, right? Because I know that, you know, if I'm taking the number 16, for example, you know, 16 divided by two is eight. There's nothing that you could, no number greater than eight could you multiply by to get 16. So I can actually, my, iter, my loop can go from two all the way up to value divided by two. So up to value divided by two. I'm going to create a variable called primee. I'm going to assume the value of it is prime. If value modulo i equals zero, prime e equals false, and I can break out of the loop, and then I can say return prime e. So I've written my function just to test if it works. I can say is prime, and by the way, you can do this now in the P5 web editor. You can execute code in the console. Is prime seven. True, is prime 10. False. All right, so hopefully it works correctly. What's that? I can do better than just divided by two? <laughs> Thank you, live Twitch chat that's participating in this recording session. I can do all the way up to square root of the number. Since I can only go up to square root of the number, the number squared, uh, and never higher. So that's possibly one additional optimization. Well, well a value. But square root is a slow operation, so I could even do a test of like i squared or something. But this is too much. Like I don't really need to worry about optimizing this right now. Um, if I wanted to optimize the visualization, it probably would make sense for me to like pre-compute a whole bunch of primes and calculating whether a number is prime in optimal ways is the subject for another video. Would love to hear your favorite algorithm for doing so in the comments, and maybe I can return and look at some of those in a future live stream or video. But let me make sure my square root possibility works. No, 25 is not prime. Less than or equal to, it must be. There, yes, obviously I need to check five, okay? I can't check only up to the square root, I've gotta check the square root. Seven is prime, let's try a much higher prime number. Two, one, three, seven, let's give that one a whirl. There we go, I think my function is working. All right, so let's try only drawing the circle now if the value is prime. Let's make the circle a little bit bigger, just so we can see it. And drum roll please. Looks pretty great. Oh dear, have I let one be prime again? That's a nice fix to it. There we go, now I've gotten rid of one as prime. Well, this is just lovely. Let's see how far we can push this just in P5 itself. I'm changing the step size to five. And while this is running in the background, 
Let me just finish off this video by very quickly porting this to processing, which is a nice environment for me to try to render a really high resolution image. And the other thing we're gonna get is you get to see the newest processing for beta. Yay! I actually haven't downloaded it. It's processing 4.0 beta 5 as of February 3rd, 2022. Today is February 11th, 2022. And if you haven't seen it, processing 4 has a theme selector. My favorite. All right, so this did not continue to animate because the canvas will go to sleep in the background if it's not currently live. Also, um, I realize now this, I don't need the break. I can just say return false right here. And I actually don't need this primary variable. If I get to the end, I can just return true. So I was struggling to name that and now I've even made it simpler. So let's leave this running in the background. I'm gonna take all of this code and I'm gonna copy paste it into processing and I'm going to use my magic typing power to very quickly port this over from JavaScript into Java, which is the programming language behind processing. Well, that was surprisingly easy. <laughs> Let's check on our browser. Still churning away. In processing, I am going to remove the lines and I am going to do the entire thing all at once. So instead of drawing it as an animation, I just want to see the whole thing all at once. So let me circle back and just say a few quick notes about this conversion. So variables need types in processing. That's what int is for, for integer. Functions need to specify their return type. So I've got to specify Boolean. Again, the argument needs a data type. Uh, I don't, if, if a function doesn't return something, I say void, create canvas's size. Otherwise, pretty much everything is the same. And there we go, boom, just like that. That's even uh, higher, finer, higher resolution. Now let's make the step size one. We can zoom into it and see, there we go. Let's see how far we can push this. Let's say at the end, save, prime spiral.png and let's make this, I don't know, 1920 by 1920. Let's see how long this takes to compute. Wow! <laughs> Amazing. I can look at the image I just saved and I can zoom way into it and see there we've got the prime spiral. This one is still humming along. So if you want to understand more about the Ulam spiral and the prime spiral, there's a wonderful number file video that I haven't watched all the way through because I didn't want it to inform what I'm doing so much. But as soon as I stop recording this, I'm going to go and watch it. And I'll, I'll uh, link to it in the video description. Obviously, there's other references online that you could read about, like this article from the American Mathematical Monthly, which talks about how the lines correspond to quadratic forms. I'm also going to put up on the screen here, I'll do this later, I'm going to make a version of this spiral where I randomly pick points to draw a circle for, whether or not they're prime. But that distribution of how many points I pick randomly will follow the same distribution of prime numbers. That distribution is referenced here in this paper as log n over n. So we can see, are we, is there really a pattern to the primes or is it just random? I expect, as I'm showing you, there really is a pattern there. What other beauty can you find in the Ulam spiral, in the prime spiral? I want you to show me. So take this code, try color, try shapes, try 3D. I don't know anything that you could imagine and share it with me. In the video description, I'll include links on how you can do that. And I can't wait to see you on the next coding challenge. Goodbye. Choo-choo. <laughs>